Well, good morning, all. Good morning, and thank you all for being here. Uh, now, before I begin the morning's announcement, let me just take one moment to mention Captain Robert Melton, a 17-year veteran of the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department, who was shot and killed in the line of duty yesterday while responding to a call about a drive-by shooting. Our hearts go out to Captain Melton's family and his loved ones and to all of those who are suffering in this time of grief. And of course, our support goes out to his colleagues on the Kansas City Police Department, our colleagues as well. And this devastating loss is yet another reminder that our courageous officers put their lives on the line every day in order to serve the public, in order to serve us, not only in the times of heightened tensions in which we find ourselves or during ambush scenarios, as tragic as those are, but all day and every day. And the Department of Justice is committed to doing all that we can to support our officers at every level and to keep them safe from harm. And we will continue to advance that work and to keep that promise, even as we mourn the loss of yet another guardian, another colleague, another friend. Now, for today's announcement, I am joined today by Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division, Leslie Caldwell. I'm also joined by the United States Attorney for the Central District of California, Eileen Decker. I'm joined by FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe and Richard Weber, Chief of the Criminal Investigation Division at the Internal Revenue Service. And we are here to announce a significant step in our ongoing work to combat global corruption and to ensure that the United States offers no safe haven to those who illegally use public funds for private gain. And today, the Department of Justice has filed a civil complaint seeking to forfeit and recover more than $1 billion in assets associated with an international conspiracy to launder funds stolen from One Malaysia Development Barad, or 1MDB, a company wholly owned by the government of Malaysia. Now, the $1 billion in assets that we're discussing today are just a portion of the more than $3 billion that was stolen from 1MDB and laundered through American financial institutions in violation of United States law. 1MDB was created by the Malaysian government to promote economic development through international partnerships and foreign direct investment with the ultimate goal of improving the well-being of the Malaysian people. But unfortunately, sadly, tragically, a number of corrupt 1MDB officials treated this public trust as a personal bank account. Now, our complaint alleges that from 2009 through 2015, these officials and their associates conspired to misappropriate and launder billions of dollars from 1MDB. And as my colleagues will explain in further detail, the co-conspirators laundered their stolen funds through a complex web of opaque transactions and fraudulent shell companies with bank accounts in countries around the world, including Switzerland, Singapore, and the United States. Now, the funds were then used to purchase a range of assets for the conspirators and their relatives and associates, including high-end real estate in New York and Los Angeles, artworks by Vincent van Gogh, Claude Monet, and a jet aircraft. Today's case is the largest single action ever brought by the department's Kleptocracy Asset Recovery Initiative, which was established by Attorney General Eric Holder in 2010 to forfeit the proceeds of foreign official corruption and were possible to use the recovered assets to benefit the people harmed. This case and the Kleptocracy Initiative as a whole should serve as a sign of our firm commitment to fighting international corruption. And it should also send a signal that the Department of Justice is determined to prevent the American financial system from being used as a conduit for corruption. And it should make clear to corrupt officials around the world that we will be relentless in our efforts to deny them the proceeds of their crimes. Now, of course, a case like this takes a team, and let me thank the team of prosecutors and paralegals from the Criminal Division's Asset Forfeiture and Money Laundering Section and the United States Attorney's Office for the Central District of California, who have worked tirelessly on this matter. I also want to thank the agents from the FBI's International Corruption Unit and the IRS Criminal Investigations Division who assisted them in this case. And I'm also grateful to the Criminal Division's Office of International Affairs for their vital contributions. Now, at this time, I will turn the podium over to Assistant Attorney General Leslie Caldwell, who will speak in further detail about today's filing. Thank you.
Thank you, Attorney General Lynch. This is really a significant milestone in the department's kleptocracy initiative and in our general fight against global corruption. Uh, the complaint that was filed today really get, goes into great detail about the complex web of transactions that these co-conspirators used to launder billions of dollars that they stole from the people of Malaysia. We have several speakers today who are going to talk about different aspects of the case. What I would like to focus on for now are allegations in the complaint involving two bond offerings in 2012 through which 1MDB raised the money, some of the money, that was siphoned off by the corrupt officials and their associates. The stated purpose of the bond offerings was to allow 1MDB to raise money so that it could invest in various energy assets on behalf of the Malaysian government and the Malaysian people. But almost immediately after receiving the proceeds of the two bond issues, roughly 40% of the money that was raised which was about 1.37 billion, the 40% was the 1.37 billion, was transferred out of 1MDB's accounts and was transferred into a Swiss bank account that was in the name of a shell corporation incorporated in the British Virgin Islands. The complaint alleges that the name of that shell company was chosen because it sounded like the name of a legitimate company that was involved in the bond offering. But in fact, the Swiss bank account was controlled by corrupt officials and by their associates. From Switzerland, the corrupt officials uh, and their associates transferred money using a series of transactions involving still more shell companies and more bank accounts located all over the globe. Eventually, more than $230 million of that money found its way into accounts in the names of shell companies whose beneficial owner was a close relative of a senior 1MDB official. That individual used that money to buy luxury real estate in the United States and other assets, um, and also used the money to fund a California-based motion picture company called Red Granite Pictures. Red Granite Pictures, in turn, used more than $100 million of that money uh, to finance the award-winning 2013 film, The Wolf of Wall Street. Of course, neither 1MDB or the Malaysian people ever saw a penny of profit from that film or from any of the other assets that were purchased with funds that were siphoned from 1MDB. Instead, that money went to relative and associates of the corrupt officials uh, of 1MDB and others. Because the assets were uh, laundered money, the future rights to that film are subject to the forfeiture complaint that's been filed today in Los Angeles. The significant assistance that we've gotten from international partners in this case has, has really been critical in identifying and restraining assets. And I think that international cooperation and the action we're taking today, which I said, as the Attorney General said, is the largest action taken to date in, our, in connection with our kleptocracy initiative, it should really send a message to kleptocrats, to corrupt officials around the world, that the United States is not a safe haven for their stolen money, and they cannot evade law enforcement simply through the use of shell companies, nominee entities, uh, and other structures that are essentially designed to thwart law enforcement. The department will continue to track and will continue to seize assets that kleptocrats and other corrupt officials steal from the people of their countries. And I'd now like to turn it over to Eileen Decker from the U.S. Attorney's Office in California. Good morning. Uh, as noted, my name is Eileen Decker. I'm the United States Attorney for the Central District of California, which is based in Los Angeles. The asset forfeiture complaints were filed this morning by prosecutors in my office in the United States District Court in Los Angeles. Another phase of this money laundering scheme occurred in early 2013 in connection with a third bond offering arranged by Goldman Sachs International. In this offering, 1MDB raised approximately $3 billion purportedly to fund a joint venture with an entity controlled by the government of Abu Dhabi to promote growth and development in both Malaysia and Abu Dhabi. Once more, instead of using the money raised in the offering for its intended purposes, the corrupt individuals involved with 1MDB and their associates misappropriated a significant portion of the funds raised. In fact, only days after the initial bond sale, approximately $1.26 billion was diverted for the benefit of individuals associated with 1MDB. 
approximately $137 million of the pilfered money was spent to purchase works of art, including a $35 million work by Claude Monet, a view of San Giorgio Maggiore in Venice. But these works of arts were not put in museums in Malaysia for the benefit of the population. Rather, they were obtained to further enhance the luxury and lavish lifestyles of those stealing money from one MDV. Funds diverted from the third bond offering were also traced to the purchase of an interest in the Park Lane Hotel in New York. And we seek to forfeit approximately a quarter of a billion dollars invested in that luxury hotel. The laundering of the proceeds continued throughout 2013 with an additional $106 million used to purchase an interest in EMI music publishing. EMI is the world's third largest music publishing company by revenue, and the company has the rights to publish approximately 2.3 million musical compositions, including a number of chart-topping hits from Grammy Award-winning artists. Since the conspirators purchased the interest in EMI, it was they and not the citizens of Malaysia who earned money every time those songs were performed publicly, recorded, or downloaded. In seeking to seize these forfeited items, the Department of Justice is sending a message that we will not allow the United States to become a playground for the corrupt, that we will not allow it to be a platform for money laundering or a place to hide and invest in stolen riches. Thank you very much. And now I'll turn the podium over to FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe. Good morning. So I'll walk you through the details of one of the additional schemes that have been outlined in today's complaint. So as alleged in the complaint, not long after 1MDB was established in 2009, corrupt officials at 1MDB and their associates began a sophisticated scheme to enrich themselves. In the first two years of its existence, more than $1 billion was transferred out of 1MDB to bank accounts in the names of shell corporations. These shell companies were controlled by associates of corrupt 1MDB officials. The funds were stolen under the pretense of having 1MDB invest in an oil exploration joint venture with a foreign partner. On paper, the $1 billion was to be 1MDB's investment in what purported to be natural resource rights. But this wasn't a legitimate investment for 1MDB or for the Malaysian people. Instead, the funds transferred to the shell companies were used for the personal enrichment of the corrupt officials and their associates. They used the money to pay gambling debts at Las Vegas casinos. They rented luxury yachts. They hired an interior decorator in London. They spent millions on property, some of which is subject to seizure and forfeiture based on the complaint filed today. Among the purchases was a Bombardier jet for the purchase price of about $35 million. So why does this matter so much to us? Certainly there's a lot going on in the world right now. Terrorist attacks, violent crime, serious threats to American citizens and people around the world. Why does a corruption case halfway around the world matter so much to us here today? Well, I'll tell you for a few reasons. First, because some of the profits of these schemes were invested in the United States. And when corrupt officials bring their ill-gotten gains to the United States, they also bring with them their corrupt practices and disregard for the rule of law. And that presents a threat to our economy. It impacts trade and investment. It fuels the growth of criminal enterprises and undermines our fair democratic processes. Second, because the stable, healthy democracies around the world are the cornerstone of global security. The more we can do to help our international partners establish and maintain stable governments accountable to the rule of law, the more we do to ensure U.S. national security. And finally, we do it because the FBI and the Department of Justice and our colleagues in federal law enforcement are uniquely positioned to provide this sort of assistance. The Malaysian people were defrauded on an enormous scale. It schemes whose tentacles reached around the world. This case is beyond the single, any single agency's ability to effectively investigate. 
We have investigators and prosecutors with deep experience working matters like this, so our involvement is a natural fit. Last year, we established three dedicated international corruption squads based in New York, Los Angeles, and here in Washington. These squads include agents, analysts, and accountants who are experts in complex financial schemes. These specialized teams are showing real results. This is the largest kleptocracy seizure in U.S. history. We hope this investigation will send a message to corrupt officials around the world that no person, no company, no organization is too big, too powerful, or too prominent. No one is be above or beyond the law. So at this point, I'd like to thank a few of our partners. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our FBI legal attaché offices. These teams are stationed overseas to coordinate global investigations like this. And part of their job is to build strong partnerships so that we can work closely, quickly, and efficiently with our international partners on criminal and terrorist threats. I'd also like to thank our partners with the IRS, with the Los Angeles U.S. Attorney's Office, the Criminal Division here at the Department of Justice, and of course our agents and analysts in the FBI's New York and Los Angeles field offices. This case is ongoing. Corruption, unfortunately, will never be eradicated because, quite frankly, greed never goes away. But we are committed to working with our partners here at home and around the world to do what we can to stop it, to ensure the legitimacy of public officials and to create a level playing field for all. Now I'd like to introduce Chief Richard Weber of the IRS Criminal Investigation Division. Thank you, Deputy Director. Good morning, everybody. On behalf of IRS Criminal Investigation, I'm proud to stand here with the Attorney General to announce the seizure of several real properties and assets in connection with the investigation. One MDB was originally established to drive strategic initiatives for long-term economic development of Malaysia. Instead, it is alleged that money was siphoned from this fund for personal investment, not for the good of the Malaysian people and not for the achievement of their goals. The case is another example of IRSCI's unique ability to follow the money through complex money laundering schemes and a web of opaque transactions and fraudulent shell corporations. In October of 2015, my LA field office joined the investigation specifically focusing on Riza Aziz and red granite pictures. Approximately 238 million was wired to red granite capital in Singapore, an entity controlled by Aziz. It is further alleged that wire transfers totaling approximately $64 million were sent from the red granite capital account to an account at City National Bank in the United States maintained by red granite pictures, a production company also owned by Aziz. This money was then used to fund red granite pictures operations, including the production of the film The Wolf of Wall Street. Additionally, the misappropriation of funds were used to acquire nearly $100 million in real estate in the U.S. and the United Kingdom and elsewhere for the benefit of Aziz, including um, in the list of properties, and we have the properties uh, outlined in the civil forfeiture complaint um, and in various uh, diagrams. Um, but the properties include a Beverly Hills mansion currently under construction, a park laurel condo in New York City and a townhouse in the United Kingdom. Fighting worldwide corruption is in the interest of the United States. Corruption threatens good governance, sustainable development, and the dem dem democratic process and fair business practices. Corruption erodes trust in government and private institutions alike. It undermines confidence in the fairness of free and open markets, and it breeds contempt for the rule of law. This investigation is continuing and ongoing. And let me emphasize that we will not allow the massive, brazen, and blatant diversion of billions of dollars from one MDB and the alleged laundering of those funds through U.S. financial institutions to continue. 
This case represents a model for international cooperation in significant cross-border money laundering matters and sends a message that criminals cannot evade law enforcement authorities simply by laundering money through multiple jurisdictions and through a web of shell corporations. Uh, thank you, and let me turn the podium back to the Attorney General. Thank you, Chief Weber. And we're happy to take some questions at this time. If this is a fund that's wholly owned by the Malaysian government, at what point, if ever, did the Malaysian government send up a flare and say, we think lots of our money is being stolen? Well, you know, the investigation is ongoing, so we're actually not able to provide a lot of detail now as to when we began looking into this or what precipitated that. Um, when we get to the conclusion of that, we may be able to provide more information about that, but I'm not able to go into well, that now. The Malaysian officials were aware that <coughs> projects weren't being funded the way they were supposed to and that the money that was being raised was not being diverted correctly to the... Well, you know, certainly I can't speak to the state of mind of the individuals at that time. I, I certainly think that, um, as we've indicated, um, people are, are aware of our investigation and aware of the issues that have been raised there. And it certainly is our hope and goal at the conclusion of this forfeiture process to return the funds to Malaysia. Whether those initial projects are, are, are still going to be used or not, we don't know. But certainly they could be used by the government for the benefit of the people there. Thank you. Prime Minister Najib helped set up one in 2009, and he does not seem to be named in any of the court documents that you filed today. Um, would you rule out um, implicating him in any of uh, your future investigations or um, court filings? You know, we don't have a specific comment on anyone who hasn't been named so far because this is a civil forfeiture complaint. It's going to look a little bit different from what you've seen before. We are essentially describing the tracing of the assets, the use of the funds, and who was involved in the transactions there. So we're not commenting on anyone else uh, who may or may not be named in the matter at this time. Was there some kind of agreement, though, between U.S. prosecutors and the Malaysian government not to name the Prime Minister? Our agreement is only to draft the complaint as we always do in civil forfeiture matters. You'll see that this is a complaint that is against the actual property or assets as opposed to against an individual. We don't have any announcements on anyone who's not named so far. So this will be a complaint that uh, seeks to restrain and forfeit the specific assets mentioned. And then now come to you. $3 billion misappropriated, why are you only seeking forfeiture of $1 billion? Concept? At this point, as, you, as you'll see from the complaint, which is rather lengthy, but you'll see from the complaint, we've been able to trace approximately a $1 billion uh, as having gone through the U.S. financial systems. Uh, and that money laundering essentially gives us the jurisdiction over those assets. We've also been able to locate specific assets in the U.S. and overseas. As also was described, however, and as often as common in corruption cases, a lot of the funds were dissipated, paying gambling expenses, lifestyle expenses, uh, things of that nature, and so a lot of the funds have been dissipated. But as we've noted, this investigation is ongoing, and to the extent that we can, in fact, uh, clearly locate other assets and trace them, we would continue the actions here. What is the, what's the specific process for the Wolf of Wall Street's probably like the most well-known asset? How do you cope about getting the, the rights to the, is it the whole movie or just Red gates, red, portion, red granite. Red granite portion of the assets, then how do you collect the royalties? Essentially, we're seeking to restrain red, anything that red granite would receive on an ongoing basis from royalties or any fees coming in from their interest in that film. And what about past royalties and payments? I don't believe that we can. Let me just check with, uh, with Leslie on that. I'm sorry, I moved over here. No, I don't think we're able to, to seize anything retroactively. So going forward, and of course, it would not be um, the entire uh, proceeds of the movie, but, but what Red Granite is entitled to receive, that's what we're seeking to restrain. And then I was coming here, and then I'll go back to you, Pamela. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your comments about Captain Nelson. Attorney General, what do you believe explains the spike in attacks on police officers in this country? 
think that that is uh, certainly a very serious question, and I'm glad that it's something that's under discussion today. You know, we look at every incident and every every instance individually, and we see a number of different causes. For example, in the tragic situation yesterday, uh, this brave officer was responding to a disturbance, as so many officers do on a daily basis. We have also seen, as you are aware, situations where officers have been directly targeted and ambushed. So we're seeing danger being aimed at law enforcement from a number of sources. Um, it's the responsibility, I think, of everyone to take note of this and, and be as supportive as we can of law enforcement in these difficult times. We're continuing to do that with, with specific training focused on active shooter situations, for example, de-escalation, so that when officers find themselves in situations, we've been able to give them what, what we can to deal with these situations. Just a follow-up. I mean, what do you think has created a culture where police officers seem to be, it's almost like an open season on these individuals? I think that certainly um, law enforcement is feeling under siege because of these incidents, and, and they are tragic. Many of the efforts that the department is engaging in actually date back several years to when we saw police officers come under attack, as well as federal agents come under attack in the beginning of the administration, and the department set up a number of groups, an officer safety and wellness group, in 2011 to start working on these issues and focusing on providing training and support to both hire additional officers to support officers in the field. And I think that it's, it's worth noting that we are certainly highlighting these issues today, uh, but this is an issue that law enforcement has faced because it is a dangerous profession. And so um, they, they have continually borne this weight. Uh, and certainly we want to highlight the issues today, use them to start a conversation. But let's not forget um, that our brave men and women in law enforcement have always been engaged in an inherently dangerous undertaking. I'm going to move over to here because I did okay. promise here, and then, and then I'll come back to this gentleman. Uh, two questions for you, Madam Attorney General. The first one is, the Department of Justice moved really quickly to open a civil rights investigation into the death of Alton Sterling, but then when the death of Philando Castile, you guys are playing more of a supportive role. Since so many people saw the videos of those two shootings, can you just explain to lay people how you decide whether or not to open a federal investigation into an officer-involved shooting? Sure, surely. Um, and certainly, as you're right, both, both of those incidents, uh, also a tragic loss of life, were very visible because of video. Uh, in the case involving Mr. Sterling's um, uh, loss of life in Louisiana. That was a matter where we were requested to move in earlier. We always consult with local law enforcement, the local prosecutive officials, and I believe that the, uh, the district attorney's office in Baton Rouge has publicly stated that they felt the need to recuse themselves, um, and that was a decision that they came to on their own. In that instance, they asked us to come in earlier than we would have. Typically, our view and our role is to support the local law enforcement and local prosecutors in their investigation. We typically await the results of uh, those investigations, and if any cases come about at, uh, as a result of those, we await that before we move forward. Every state is different also. There are states in which if the federal government moves first in a matter, we may preclude state action, depending upon state double jeopardy laws. So because of that, our typical posture is to wait until local law enforcement and prosecutors have handled the matter through their system. Where we're asked to come in earlier, we do take those, those under uh, consideration, and if we feel that, again, we are able to do so, as in Baton Rouge, we will. So Baton Rouge is a bit of an unusual situation, again, because of the recusal. And the second question is just about last week's ruling in the so-called Microsoft Ireland case. Uh, FBI may, may or may not want to weigh in on this as well. I mean, how, how much more difficult is your job now after that decision? So people have suggested that an inability to access data that's stored outside the United States is even a greater threat than perhaps the so-called going dark or encryption problem. Well, certainly it raises serious concerns for us, uh, as was evidenced in, in, uh, in our views in the case uh, before the decision came down. We're still looking at that decision uh, and determining what the next steps are. We also work very closely with our foreign counterparts in the European Union, for example, and are very committed to working with them to come up with agreements where we can share law enforcement or even commercial data safely and securely and protect privacy. It is a decision that may have some impact on that, and we're still looking at the ramifications of that. Um, where do, do you know if uh, any financial institutions like Goldman Sachs were aware of the money money laundering that was going on, and is that something you plan to investigate going forward? Well, I can tell you that again, we're focusing now on the tracing of the assets. Leslie, do you want to add anything on on any one, any of the entities there? 
so I can't comment on the investigation uh, that we've done thus far, but you can see in the complaint that Goldman Sachs and a number of other institutions were involved in various aspects of these transactions. Um, we are continuing to investigate and, and we'll, we'll go wherever that evidence takes us. Um, the case does target the head of state of a U.S. ally. To what extent did diplomatic concerns play any role in the case, or were there any discussions with the State Department about this? And then two, also, um, why not charge the people that you name in the forfeiture action? Why just bring the forfeiture action first? Well, at this point, it's very important for us uh, with respect to forfeiture when we have the evidence that we can, in fact, seek restraint of assets to move uh, in order to avoid them being further dissipated, sold to someone else, or transferred to someone uh, else that would, that would make it harder for us to actually restrain those assets. As with all cases, even with civil forfeiture, we bring the action when the facts and the evidence come together and when we feel that we have sufficient cause uh, to get a judicial order allowing for seizure and restraint of assets, and that's where we are here. Uh, with respect to government officials in Malaysia, I don't have a comment on anyone in, in, in particular except to say that Malaysia does continue to be an ally of ours, particularly in counterterrorism efforts. Um, but this effort is intended to, through as is the entire kleptocracy initiative, to essentially ultimately benefit that country by allowing the return of assets at the end of this process to the government of Malaysia and to the Malaysian people. Um, you met yesterday with uh, President Obama, Director Comey, and uh, Homeland Security Secretary Johnson um, to talk about these the tensions between um, with with police killings. Um, could I just get your readout of that meeting? Um, what, what was the point of the of having the meeting? And and do you feel that at this point there's anything more that the administration you know should be doing to to uh, help uh, tamp down the tensions that have that, that have flared? Well, the president had himself provided a readout of that meeting at, the, at its conclusion, um, so I don't have more to add to it than that except to reiterate that the president did want to meet with myself, uh, the director Comey, and Secretary Johnson to review the efforts that this administration uh, is, is taking and has taken for some time to support law enforcement in the field. As I mentioned earlier, the efforts that the Department of Justice has been taking for some time include through our grant making process providing uh, for the hiring and retention of officers, also the training of officers as is often requested by officers in the field in areas like active shooting, de-escalation. Also the efforts that we undertake through the department's many facets including our civil rights division and our cops office where we provide direct peer-to-peer -peer support. We often do a lot of work matching up law enforcement agencies who've dealt with a particular crisis or situation with other departments who see it developing in their area. We will connect police chiefs to police chiefs to have those discussions uh, and try and be uh, a way of, of, uh, of expanding the, dis the discussion and the dialogue. So we talked about the things that the department has, do has been doing and is going to continue to do. Uh, we also spoke about the efforts ongoing throughout the department to support both law enforcement and a constructive dialogue on this issue. As many of you know, I've been engaged in a community policing tour for the last year and have visited 12 cities focusing on the issue of police community relations, highlighting cities that have had a very difficult, very challenged relationship between the community and law enforcement, yet jurisdictions that have done the hard work and established a positive working relationship. Not perfect because there's no perfect situation, but a relationship where there's community interaction with the police department on issues of training, on issues of community involvement, and where there's direct law enforcement involvement in getting to know the community, particularly businesses, young people, and bringing all those voices together. And we spent time talking about how we can advance those efforts and continue those discussions, which many people have found helpful, I think, is it, and, and I think um, are something that other communities, I hope, would also find helpful. I think that we're in a situation where people are, are truly recognizing that the tragedies that we are seeing are affecting all of us. Um, that, that individuals who talk about not feeling safe um, are also echoing what our police officers say when they talk about how they are not safe in many situations. Uh, and that is not a situation for, for growth 
uh, and doesn't bring out the best of us. And I think we're also in a situation where people really want things to improve. They want everyone to get home safely. Uh, they want law enforcement officers to feel supported, and they want to be able to call on law enforcement officers when they are in trouble. Uh, that has always been an issue that certainly I have seen in my over 20 years in law enforcement. And so we're talking about ways in which we can advance that discussion. Let me go to the gentleman behind you. Thanks. Uh, I just want to follow up on the question about Prime Minister Najib. The description in the complaint of Malaysian official number one uh, certainly seems to match the Prime Minister's biography and job description. Can you elaborate a little bit on the legal considerations involved that prevent you or, or uh, that help you decide not to identify that official and others by name when several other people were identified by what I can say to that is, as I've indicated before, when, the, when we have a civil complaint that traces assets uh, from any entity through others and into an asset that we're trying to seize, we essentially allege what we need to allege with specificity in order to obtain the legal process that we need to obtain. Uh, we don't go beyond that, and so, and so we're not going beyond that in this particular complaint. Last question. Uh, Deputy Director McCabe, could I ask you for your assessment on the current threat to uh, law enforcement, sort of the environment, uh, whether quantitatively more threat streams to law enforcement? Are you guys seeing that? So we track those numbers closely. I don't have uh, uh, figures to share with you here today. Obviously, not the the topic of our uh, of our announcement. Um, suffice it to say that we work very closely with our state and local partners across. Uh, across the country. We have over 17,000 police departments in this country uh, covering a broad, vast, and diverse uh, uh, geography. Every community is a little bit different. Each place um, poses a different set of challenges and, and demands. Our challenge as a, as a federal and national law enforcement uh, organization is to provide support and assistance and guidance to those individual law enforcement uh, agencies to the greatest extent that we can. One of the ways that we do that is we watch uh, for and, and communicate threats to law enforcement whenever they come uh, to our attention. Uh, we've certainly been doing that a lot lately, but beyond that, I can't really give you a characterization. Thank you all. Thank you.